This is the Permaculture Podcast. I'm Scott Mann. My guest is Delvin Solkinson. Over the last two decades, Delvin studied permaculture education all over the world by taking numerous permaculture design courses and teacher trainings, as well as completing multiple diplomas with various teachers. Some of his mentors include Bill Mollison, April Sampson Kelly, and Rosemary Morrow. From those years of experience, he works to make this knowledge more accessible for students, easier to teach for instructors, and empowering for everyone by sharing his notes in an open-source approach to permaculture. Enjoy this conversation with Delvin, and I'll join you again after. Then Delvin, can you give us a bit of your biography and background, and then we'll talk about your work in permaculture education and making the PDC and related information more accessible? Well, it all began in 2002. I took an online course with April Sampson Kelly. It was one of the first online courses in permaculture education. So I've been thinking about it lately since there's such a big move to online. And it was the first course that Bill Mollison sanctioned. And I took it on a little farm with a local group of people. So it was kind of like we facilitated it ourselves with the guidance of this online structure. And soon after that, I, I mean, it really got me going. Soon after that, I found myself as a student. I got a grant as a student, summer student, and kind of began my journey with permaculture uh, by connecting with Bill Mollison and letting him know that I was keen and excited to apply permaculture to my community in whatever way I could, and that I wanted to start on his diploma. At the time, the original diploma through the Permaculture Institute in Tasmania was really a participant-driven, self-directed program. So he just kind of sent me running and said, give me the report at the end of the two years. So I got uh, money from the federal government of Canada to take a group of youth at risk with my partner, Ainsley Crone, and try and initiate them into the new world of work. So it was a lot of resume building, portfolio building activities, but it also had to do with life skills. So we did a full permaculture design certificate, which I facilitated, but it was also through this online course with April Sampson Kelly. So it was almost like I had training wheels for my first class because I was really just facilitating the structure and the curriculum that she was giving online. And uh, we went out and built community gardens and grew food for the food bank and went into the elementary school system and did a lot of work in the classroom and taking the kids outside of the classroom onto the school grounds and building community gardens and learning gardens. So that's kind of how I got started. That was the first diploma with Bill Mollison. For two years, we had that program and then we lost our grant eventually. And then when I look over the information of yours that I've seen over the years, it seems like you start there with April Sampson Kelly, you go on and you study with Bill Mollison, but you've also done a lot of work with many of the authors and teachers within the permaculture community to round out what it is you've been doing over the years. And now, as I understand it, you're the diploma coordinator with the Permaculture Institute. Which institute is that in North America? Is that PINA or PIUSA? That's uh, the Permaculture Institute of the U.S., permaculture.org. So Scott Pittman and Toby Hemingway and Larry Santoyo and others kind of initiated this back in the day. With studying with all these folks and where you find yourself now, what was that journey like to go from teaching that course and earning that diploma with Bill to where you find yourself now coordinating this program and developing a ton of resources around permaculture education? It's been quite a journey. It's really been the journey of a student. And I would, had just finished university. I was just finishing a post-baccalaureate through Simon Fraser University when I took this first fateful PDC class. And so that diploma, in some ways, was the beginning of my graduate work. And I really tackled it very much like a mainstream student wanting to take a lot of classes and take really good notes at those classes and organize my thoughts into reports and assessments and sort of analysis of, and synthesis of my learning. So it took me around the world and 
I really had a sense that I wanted to learn from different permaculture pioneers and put something together. So that carried me through uh, the Permaculture Academy yearbook, Bill Mollison, his original vision for permaculture was very much in tandem to the mainstream education system. He had this idea that I felt was really exciting that permaculture would use its own methods to create its own independent, non-accredited permaculture education system. But it would have the pedagogy and have the structure and the actual doing stuff and getting stuff done, you know, the hands-on element that really would make it as powerful experientially as doing a mainstream diploma or bachelor's or master's or doctorate. And at the time I had finished my bachelor's to university. So as this program went, I would be initiated into the master's. So it was a five-year master's degree through Bill Mollison and a mentor, Patricia Michaels, who's based out of Texas. And that kind of gave structure and a context for my journey and motivated me to consider all of these different classes I was taking with permaculture pioneers, mostly in Australia and North America, but then in Europe later on, consider that as part of a longer journey, a learning journey that had goals and destinations and needed to be documented and reported on very much like the diploma process, but in a more comprehensive way. And one of the studies on that journey was of other diploma programs. And I, when I finished the master's degree, I wanted to continue. And that's been my lesson of just lifelong learning and continuing. And I figured I would go and start exploring the other diploma programs at the other institutes. So I started with the Permaculture Institute in the U.S. and did, went through their diploma program. At the time, Bill Mollison's institute had sort of disbanded. So his mythical doctoral degree was kind of not being offered anymore. So I did the diploma through the Permaculture Institute and just continued to take classes and to really think about how to be a productive student and how to offer something to other students and how to offer something to other teachers. And that really defined me. And I realized at various, you know, points along the way that I had all this material from taking notes at all these different PDCs and advanced courses and teacher trainings. And I really followed the breadcrumbs. A lot of the teachers that I met introduced different ideas into my head that I sort of just ran with. And this resulted in a book and a number of different games that now over the years and these different diplomas, I've been upgrading and remixing. And anytime I take a new course, I go back and in the new edition, it reflects new learnings. You had sent me a copy of your permaculture design notes uh, a number of years ago to review and take a look at. And I was really inspired by what you had because it took so much of what I'd learned in my PDC and what I had taken from my teacher training. And it felt like when I was reading through it, as if I was getting to glance through the notebooks of my teachers with the way that it all came together. And that's where I think there's so much power in what you're doing is it helps to bring all of this knowledge from so many different teachers and courses into one space that then people can kind of pull from and remix and use in their courses to continue the evolution of permaculture from things like the designer's manual that Bill wrote back in the 1980s. And then, you know, building on the work of so many of our other great authors like Dave Jackie or David Holmgren, the work that's coming out of the Pacific Northwest with like Jude Hobbs and her long running teacher training, that we have all of this information now in one place to really pull from. And in this modern era, when we're looking at what can permaculture education look like beyond the PDC? What does urban permaculture look like? What does social permaculture emerge as in the landscape and on the ground work? You have a little bit of everything for people collected in these resources that you've developed over the years. Yeah, it does reflect the growth of permaculture. And one of my mentors, Rosemary Morrow, who has been one of the people who's guided me on the journey of creating this book and given me feedback and read through the book in various iterations, 
she's always looking to the emerging edge of permaculture and areas that are really important for holistic design, but aren't yet in the PDC curriculum. So I really dove into the curriculum and continue to because it is growing and evolving, but kind of became like a PDC curriculum. It was like a hobby, I guess, really getting into the PDC curriculum and identifying what are the core principles, what are the core design methods, you know, what are the core techniques or facts about nature that some of the great permaculture pioneers consider to be really essential and core to the PDC. And in Canada, we have something called uh, Coles Notes, and I think in the U.S. it's Cliff Notes. But I really wanted to not rewrite the designer's manual or create something like other permaculture textbooks, and there's so many great textbooks out there. I really wanted to synthesize it and have it be almost like a set of notes where when you see one note, you might have to go and read a chapter in another book if that's something that you're really interested in. But as permaculture tries to do, I really wanted to essentialize it so that if you didn't go and read that other chapter in the book, you would be aware that the information existed. And in your design life, if you came across that, a particular situation in which that might be relevant, you would kind of cue your memory and you could always go in and, and do a deep dive into that particular area. So then it serves a role then as kind of like an accessory to whatever core text someone might want to use, whether that's the designer's manual or Rosemary Morrow's Earth User's Guide to Permaculture, or even, you know, some of the other great texts that we have out there, that this can be something then that bolsters and expands on that information and grows the PDC in the moment then for whoever's teaching it? Yeah, definitely. It's really about uh, open source permaculture as well, and really trying to network with different teachers and people in the movement to create a free accessible database of permaculture concepts and ideas. And that might rem help people in their learning journey or their teaching, or it could just help people in their design process. But I almost imagine the whole set of notes as a designer's checklist, where you could kind of go through and make a decision at each point of like, oh, this is relevant and how might I apply it? Or no, this isn't something I need to look into at this time. And it would inform your design process like the designer's checklist and remind you to make sure that you are thinking holistically and integrating all the different aspects. Regretfully, we weren't able to record this in time for a recent Kickstarter that you ran, but that just completed successfully. And so you're going to be releasing a new copy of the Permaculture Design Notes book. How does this version compare to what you already have out there? It's really gotten a lot bigger. It's been, I think, 18 years developing this book, and the last edition was maybe 250 pages, and this new one will be 500 pages. It's really a compendium. I've gotten help from some incredible allies around the world of mine to refine and do a final expansion of the curriculum for this edition, and I'm sure there'll be future editions. And there's also an extensive section on food preservation and animal care that my wife, Grace, has written, which goes into quite a bit of detail about different heritage breeds and animal care aspects. And then I've been interviewing all the classes I've taken over the years. I've interviewed the teachers, many of them anyway. And so I thought I'd just put in all of the different interviews of these different permaculture pioneers. So there's a large section at the end that also includes that. And then there's a teacher's book that I've been working on in tandem, which is like notes from all the teacher trainings. And it's intended to be a sort of permaculture design style, how to teach in any field. So a pattern level teaching manual. And that includes a lot of material from directly from the teachers that I've taken the teacher trainings in that they've given me at the class or given me permission to use after or have just sent me in over the years, I've asked for articles or lists of top tips, do's and don'ts, and best practices for teaching. So that's in there too. So it's kind of more of a compendium now of different sections. I'm ecstatic and really looking forward to it because it's one of the pieces that for me has been, I think, missing in the last few years is something that complements those 
permaculture texts really well. The only other one that I can think of off the top of my head, well, I guess there are two. There's Rosemary Morrow's Earth User's Guide to Teaching Permaculture, which kind of gives us a bunch of some cribbed notes, if you will, on what we can do as a teacher in the classroom, but then also teaching permaculture creatively that came out of Australia and has been floating around for a long time. But those are both books that have been in print for some time. And so now we have something that's emerging here in like the fifth decade of permaculture that can take us from this moment forward. That's fantastic. Yeah, actually, Robin Clayfield, who I've studied with in the UK and Australia, is a major contributor to the teacher's manual. And a lot of the material is updated from her. And then Rosemary Morrow also has given a huge amount of material. And I actually recently helped her to publish her Permaculture Teaching Matters. It's already a free download, but it's also available through an online printer in the U.S. for incredibly cheap. Like, I think it's $10 for this soft cover book. And that's a new updated edition. I just put it up within the last year, her teaching course for permaculture teachers. But the thing I hoped for this teaching manual is that it, was, it would be more how to use permaculture to support people to teach in general and look at a more pattern level. So it wasn't just applying to teaching permaculture. So it kind of emerges then as a permaculturist's approach to pedagogy and teaching in the classroom, whether or not it's permaculture or any other subject. Yeah, I mean, the idea is that the book models a bit of the succession of the permaculture journey, where there's the core curriculum of the permaculture design course, and then you get all this information on medicine making from Kim Chi, my co-teacher in British Columbia, and this extensive information on fermenting and food preservation, as well as animal care and natural building. And so you get a bunch of the technique stuff that has to do with that period of application. And then there's that realization that, you know, we're all teachers, whether it's formally or informally. So there's this whole practice after you've built out your sites where you're showing people and explaining to people about what you've done and why. And that comes in with all these top tips and best practices for communicating and sharing information. And then it kind of opens up at the end with all of this advice and wisdom from different permaculture pioneers over the last 16 years from these interviews and just how to live and their reflections more on a social permaculture kind of way, but also their attempts to really synthesize permaculture and apply it. I mean, my favorite question was always, what is the future of permaculture? So there's a lot of reflections from them on that. Those are some of the conversations that I frequently have behind the scenes here at the Permaculture Podcast when I'm interviewing people. You know, as we wind down and finish the interview, it's like, you know, what are your thoughts on where we go next and what will our next steps look like? And it's always fascinating. As so often happens running this show for so many years, I realize there are a ton of conversations that I wish I had recorded. And as we're talking now, you remind me of all those pieces that were never put down and saved except for in my memories of the time spent with all these amazing people. That's wonderful. I'm sure you have many books inside your head from all of these journeys you've taken with so many different permaculture teachers and explorers and designers. And one of the things that I've been reflecting on lately is what does permaculture education look like moving forward? There are some conversations I've had about, you know, do we as a community need to look at the permaculture design course and consider revising it within the framework of what exists now? Do we need to write something new or do we need to look at what do post PDC classes look like in order to support students and teachers long term in their journey in trying to deepen their understanding of design and the application of permaculture? And with your place as a director of the diploma programs of having spent so much time in different PDCs and teacher trainings and worked with so many great teachers, do you have any thoughts or insights into that from this unique place that you sit in? Exciting questions. I'll start with the PDC. It's really interesting because synthesizing the permaculture design curriculum into a set of notes it's almost essentializes the course itself into information. And of course, the permaculture design course is not just a collection of information. 
if it was, it would be enough just to read some books. It's an experience of learning and learning how to learn and learning how to teach and learning how to build relationships with other people and, and having a direct transformational experiential journey into the natural world and nature, including our nature and our inner nature, but also very much about the world around us that we share. And the foundation, as Rosemary Morrow often reminds me, is the ethics and how to apply these deeper values that we feel to what we do and how we live and how we earn money and what we have to contribute to the world. And these are things that really come out of the permaculture design certificate sort of initiation, which is really what the course is. It's an initiation into the next level of our lives. So I had a long chat with Jeff Lawton recently and made a video and put a little podcast up and was really interested to learn more about his online course. And I am fascinated to see how the permaculture design certificate course is being adapted to go online and how these elements that I mentioned can be incorporated and how an online platform can create space for people to interact and go through this experiential learning journey that is really, I think, at the heart of the permaculture design certificate course. I'd be curious on your reflections on that. I mean, what do you think for the permaculture design certificate? Is it going to go online in a hybrid way and have people have an experience and be partly online? Or what do you think the future of the permaculture design certificate course is? I think that moving online creates accessibility and makes the class affordable in ways that it hasn't been previously because teachers can be operating from wherever they are in the world to a large group of students and not have to meet the same financial requirements, you know, in both directions, while also allowing more access to the instructors during the time in which students are enrolled in the PDC, because that 72 hours that is our basic framework, we can throw that out the door and make a, an online PDC much longer if we want to and spend a lot more time with students in face-to-face -face calls because of all of our conferencing apps and everything else if we want to because of how much AV equipment has come down in price. I mean, you can get a $30 headset and microphone and be recording podcasts these days that are fairly high quality, which you can you know be turning into lectures for your students. It's easy to disseminate information. I think that the PDC can become something bigger and bolder, while also at the same time be more individualized for the students, because it's not just that like drinking from the fire hose experience of all that information that we were trying to fit in in a physical class, that now students have an opportunity to interact with their instructors, especially if it's a team of instructors running a PDC, and then be able to pull from all of that specialized knowledge to give students individual answers to what they're facing on the ground so that if someone is living in a temperate environment and isn't dealing with, you know, dry, arid climates, they can still learn that information in the PDC, but then get an additional unit specific to them and where they are. I mean, even being able to pull in regional experts in permaculture as parts of classes. And that's where I think kind of as we build and grow this, the more that we're able to cooperate and work together, that I think that it's less about like individual PDCs given by one instructor, but having someone, as you were saying earlier with the course that you took, having someone facilitate something where all of these different people can come together and it makes it for the student a more valuable experience, but also for folks who have been doing this for a long time and engaged in permaculture as teachers and leaders and authors gives us another place where we can be interacting with the community and working on that piece of our right livelihood. Amazing. Yeah, it's really interesting to me. I mean, it's the fact that it's coming back around to where I took my first PDC as a sort of hybrid where we were on a small farm with a group of people, you know, in a living classroom kind of environment uh, with the forest nearby. And we were almost like mainstream education. We, there was a curriculum that we were going through, but we were doing it in our own way together where we lived. There certainly is a lot of silver linings that address some of the challenges of the two-week course 
I've never delivered a two-week course, but I've taken some. I did a two-week course in Greece with Rosemary Morrow, which was amazing. And it really gave me this experience of the download. I did actually do it with Bill Mollison and Jeff Lawton as well in Australia. And that was actually in a classroom. It was at the seminary school where there was like a hundred of us and we were sitting in a lecture hall and seeing, you know, just experiencing this much lecture and taking in all the information. But the course that I took that really changed me was with Toby Hemingway in Portland. And he had this weekend course where once a month we would meet and he would bring a different teacher in as a guest. And that went over many months. And how my course really developed ended up being over 16 months. So we would meet for one day per month for 16 months. And we'd have, you know, a month to get settled in. And then we'd have a full year of observations. And then we'd have two months to do a design based on the full year of observations. And then there'd be the final presentation. So I really tried to spread it out because one of those silver linings to online education is you can do it at your own pace, you know, in your own way. And that has been a challenge. And I'm not even sure how, you know, it's very niche now to have people able to pay for two weeks of accommodations and food and take two weeks off work to come to one place and experience this incredibly dense program. So it is really fascinating to me to hear some of your reflections on the future of the PDC and a lot of the silver linings and opportunities that actually come from translating it into an online experience, at least having the source of it be deliverable online. That's really interesting. And that kind of stems from an interesting criticism of it is that the 72 hour course is both too much and not enough. And so that's where I think being able to deconstruct the PDC around what a student's desires are for their outcome, while as a teacher, continuing to focus on what our core materials are, really allows for a much different engagement than what we've been able to do in that I mean, my PDC was seven months long, and even then, with the access to my teachers outside of the classroom, it was 14 days over seven months, and even then, it still felt like it wasn't enough time to really dig into these ideas. And that's where I'm interested in what approaches there are to providing post-PDC support for people. As you've been a part of an inquiry that I've been putting on recently about the permaculture pit and this idea that during a permaculture educational process, whether a PDC or self-directed, there's so much amazing information that it can leave us kind of left not knowing what to do next. And that's where I wonder what we can do as a community and as teachers to aid students when they're in that place to give them the support that they need to move past that. And with your role in helping with the diplomas, What kind of work are you and others that you're in contact with doing with students after they've completed a PDC? What opportunities are available for folks that they might not be aware of when they just complete that class? That's really what kept me going. You know, the fact that I finished the PDC, went online, saw that there was a diploma and was able to get that, you know, life-changing encouragement from Bill Mollison saying, yeah, just go for it apply permaculture for two years into your life, into your livelihood, you know, in any field that you want and document that experience and think about what you're learning and learn from your mistakes and think about how you do it differently. And you can get a little bit of structure, a little bit of appreciation and recognition for the work you've done and a major goal to help and a set of smaller goals to help align yourself on and to help kind of ground in this idea of applying permaculture in any way that you want to your life. And so I've been really looking and taking a lot of the different diploma programs over the years in the world. And I love that there's such a variety. I just finished the diploma through the Permaculture Association in the UK under the tutoring of Luby McNamara, really specializing in social permaculture. And I'm currently doing the tutor training for the Permaculture Association, which is really fascinating. And they're so organized and evolved and structured. I think there's 400 people currently doing a diploma through their system right now. And they're really taking it to uh, 
almost bureaucratic level where it can, there is a source that can guide people taking a diploma as well as a future step be after taking a diploma to be able to mentor other people through diplomas. So they're really anchoring in these two further next steps of like, Hey, have a bit of structure and some mentorship to do designs and their requirements to do 10 different designs over a period of two plus years. And then for people that want to continue on, there's this opportunity to participate in a huge infrastructure that includes getting trained as a tutor at different levels, just three different levels of tutor trainings. And also they have all these courses and gatherings and convergences, and they're really building out the event structure and the online structure to support like a cultural movement. So that's kind of one edge of the spectrum, which is quite involved in the diploma is pretty high commitment doing 10 designs, uh, many of which are applied and being on a pretty formal learning path with regular check-ins with a mentor. And then that moves through various iterations through the different diploma programs. I mean, the Australian accredited diploma is even more intensive. And we also have this very professional diploma program in the, of the Permaculture Institute in North America for people that really want a lot of support and are serious about pursuing permaculture as a life path, or at least as a professional path for the time being. What we've tried to do, I was in Pennsylvania in the Amish country was on a farm. There was some Amish and some Mennonites that were doing farming. And I was thinking a lot about Rosemary Morrow. And I was thinking about the origin of the diploma with Bill Mollison, where he wanted something that was an accessible and affordable next step that anyone could do after a PDC without necessarily taking on a big commitment. So I've been working with Jason Gearhart at the Permaculture Institute, and we launched the People's Diploma, which is the new version of our diploma program that really looks to that niche more. And it's like for people that maybe don't want to invest a lot of time, energy, and money, but do want to continue on with permaculture and do want a little bit of structure and you know, like the idea of getting recognition for what they're doing and like the idea of doing some designs and, and having them checked out by other people on the journey. So it doesn't apply to everyone, but I am very interested to see the different institutes and different wings of the permaculture movement working hard and evolving their systems to provide sort of post-PDC uh, next step pathways from relatively unstructured and low commitment all the way up to like very structured and high commitment. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, this really is what I want to inspire permaculture design students and teachers to do, which is continue to learn and apply permaculture, you know, in formal ways so that's kind of the goal. I mean, I asked Bill Mollison when I finished his permaculture design course with him and Jeff Lawton in Australia, you know, what the deeper point of the PDC was. And he said, well, you know, this is after the 72 hour, the like straight 11 days lecture in the uh, lecture hall in the seminary school. And he said, well, if we can inspire people to be a little more ethical, a little more conscious to make decisions that care for the earth and people in the future, then I think the design certificate course was successful. But of course, other of us in the movement want to inspire people to go deeper than that and to adopt permaculture methods and strategies into their livelihood and lifestyle so that they can make deeper changes and deeper contributions because it really is all about service. So I kind of see that as the permaculture design course is really wanting to uplift people to be in service in whatever way they want to be and are inspired to be but to instill in people the spirit of service. And I really appreciate what you said there, because it's been a piece of the conversation for me is that permaculture, we have these conversations in the landscape, but as a philosophy and as a design curriculum, it's much bigger than just creating an ecologically sound garden that takes care of people into the future, that we can apply this to the way that our systems and our society works, the way that we look, examine our educational system. And hearing that Bill had said that, you know, apply permaculture as you like, that feels really good to hear because it was in my first interview with David Holmgren. Again, one of those moments that happened after the recording was off, and I apologize to David 
if I mischaracterize this in any way, but my recollection of it was that David was saying that he and Bill wanted permaculture to be something that we applied to what it was that we were doing, that we could learn it through something like the design course or through a standardized curriculum, but then to take it and apply it to what we were doing so that it wasn't about permaculture, but a series of permacultures, so that we would have people who were, you know, janitors and doctors and gardeners and mechanics and like every role in our society could be thought of through this permaculture lens. Yeah, exactly. That's brilliant. Well, one of the teachers that I've studied with the most extensively, uh, Larry Santoyo, I'm currently doing a post-doc sort of experimental degree uh, with him after doing a seven-year doctorate. He kind of empowered me to complete that journey with Bill and spend that period doing sort of doctoral level work, whatever that means. It was really just a permission to continue to learn and take notes and create and contribute, you know, and be of service to, to permaculture in some way. And he is one of the things he's famous for saying is, you know, you don't do permaculture. You use permaculture in what you do. And he traveled the world with Bill Mollison and really learned from him and exemplifies his teaching. And I feel like that was the message of Bill. I mean, at the end of the PDC, he said, you are all teachers already. You, have, you can go out and teach permaculture now. I encourage you to apply permaculture in any way you want to any part of your life. And if you document it, I will support you and give you a diploma after two years if you submit a folio showing that you applied permaculture. And it wasn't a professional diploma. It wasn't about being certified or, you know, having leapt through a certain amount of hoops. It was really just an empowerment, which I think reflects the next level of education, which is very much participant driven and seeing that all these schools are closed now and really thinking about the future of education and empowering people to play a really big part in what they're learning and how they're learning it. And I think the part of the early vision of permaculture is that it would support people who didn't want to go the mainstream route or did want to go the mainstream route because they could do the permaculture in tandem with mainstream education and uh, feel that there was a, a learning journey that lasts a lifetime and that there was some kind of motivation and structure to not just go on that journey, but to learn from it and think about what was learned and how to apply it and, and ultimately to become teachers because we're all teachers and we're all thinking, you know, what did I do right? How can I share that with other people? What were my mistakes? How can I share the learning from those? And to try and think about our lives on some kind of pattern level so that we continue, whether it's just our friends or our kids or our neighbors. But part of this path really is to help other people and to, to live a permaculture life in a way that inspires other people to follow their own passions, continue to be students in their own way, not to do anything specific per se, but to continue doing stuff and becoming better and learning. And I really do love Larry and his work in the world. He was one of the folks who really caused me to shift my perspective on permaculture and open up the podcast to pursue conversations like this that we're having today that are beyond just what are the practical steps that we can do to implement permaculture as a gardening or agricultural technique. I think it was him, Dave Jackie, and Mark Lakeman of City Repair. I interviewed all three of them in short succession. And all three of them were talking about how much more permaculture was. And that really got me looking at everything that was out there. And for me at the time, you mentioned, you know, paralleling permaculture. For me, I completed my permaculture design course, took my teacher training, and there Jude and Andrew had suggested that, you know, hang your shingle out, do some work for a couple of years and see where you want to go. And that's when I decided to go back to graduate school, because at the time there were still a lot of doors that were closed. And this is something that I was talking with Aaron Axelrod about in a recent interview. You know, we were talking about how we need to move past some of these places that prevent us from like living the life that we want to live, from having the experiences that we want, and so find non-traditional ways to have these deep experiences that allow us to continue to transform ourselves and transform the world. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really 
that's really the power of permaculture. I just stumbled across this quote from Bill Mollison from his autobiography, Travels and Dreams. He said, we permaculture teachers seek to empower any person by practical model making and applied work or data based on verifiable investigations. And I like thinking about that pattern level of permaculture. What are we really trying to do? And we're trying to do things in our own lives, you know, be more effective, be healthier, you know, be in an environment where we're able to follow our creative passions and be in service in a meaningful way and thus cultivate really successful relationships. But on another level, we're really here to empower other people on that journey to be motivated and inspired and passionate to engage in their life in a healthy and evolutionary way. For you, where does that take your work moving from here between the compilation of the book, your work on the diploma programs around the world, and everything that you've done to bring this information to as many people as you can? Where do you see your work continuing? Ultimately, my work continues through people that take my classes. And they're as much students of mine as they are teachers. You know, they come from all walks of life and some are young and some are old and some are starting their professional journey, but others are deep on their professional journey or really retired. I think I'm trying to share everything I've learned on some kind of pattern level. And Rosemary Morrow has been helping me to consider how to communicate clearly enough so that things can be translated. That's almost a litmus test for accessibility. Can it be easily translated into tons of languages? But there's three tools that I've been developing and continue to develop. And I intend to continue just working on those and putting out new editions and expanding them. Uh, besides the book, there's a set of cards, a permaculture design deck, which is 230 cards sharing uh, principles and methods, strategies, attitudes, and ethics. And that I made an addition to a Kickstarter about a year and a half ago, which is almost gone. So I'm hoping to continue those. And those are not in the book because there's so much content and I wanted to deliver it in small bite-sized chunks in a more dynamic form. One of the concepts that my co-teacher Kim Chi helped to develop was to turn the book into a thousand card deck, which we've done and deconstruct this lecture into at least an engaging discussion, if not a game. So we'd be out, you know, surrounded by pigs in the middle of a farm and all of the participants will have points from the design for animals unit. And then they'll have an opportunity to read that point and maybe reflect on how it's seen in the working model that surrounds us. And then I may put in my two cents to expand it or apply it in some other way. So that, those different decks are an attempt to not only give the curriculum in these small bite-sized chunks, but help people to consider how to gamify it and how to really deconstruct the lecture into something that is super participatory and involved. And then the third aspect is a permaculture design elements game, which I just finished the new version of today and sent off for a proof, which is 155 little cards and each one has a picture of an element commonly found on permaculture sites. And I put the name of that element in a bunch of languages, but I also hope that the picture itself would really communicate clearly. And then we developed a series of game boards that are about four feet by 12 feet long. So they can be printed out on huge sheets of paper, or they could be printed at any small size. But really the encouragement for this sort of game with no rules is for people to create their own base map where they live, you know, in, in the dirt outside the house, you know, in chalk on a driveway or on a huge scrap of paper that they draw it on or even articulate it in InDesign like we did and print it out on poster paper. And then these movable elements can be played onto the, you know, you can put the elements that are, already in the system down as these little cards. You can add new elements that you want and move things around and play all sorts of design games, how to apply principles, how to design, apply methods, you know, what goes where and why. 
And uh, it's kind of a game with no rules. It's really just a set of elements that are movable and that you can print at different sizes. So I was hoping that that that's something I learned from Michael Becker at a teacher training I took with him and the Bullocks at the, on Orcas Island. And I've been working on for a long time and recently got a bunch of art from Brenna Quinlan, who illustrated uh, Retro Suburbia, David Holmgren's book. So this sort of design game for design charrettes of any kind and this huge card deck of principles and, and different curricula kind of go hand in hand with this book of essentially worksheets. So I'm hoping to just continue to refine those and make a new edition of the deck as something that can support people's learning journey at any level or their teaching journey, you know, or if they're consulting or designing these things that can serve as different kinds of interactive checklists that people can use in their process. It really expands on the toolkit of what people have available to them, whatever their level of engagement is within the permaculture realm, to be able to take those cards and shuffle them and deal them out to pick the things that they might want to use in their environment from the design cards that you have, being able to pick and select different ideas and move them around on a table. It gives a tangible way to interact with something and also to kind of pull an abstract of this information out while we're working on a practical piece of that design. Yeah, it's been really fun and people use it in different creative ways. I am out here at a nonprofit organization that has a lot of community events and I started to use the design deck as an nature oracle almost like a tarot kind of deck and it was a bit tongue-in-cheek but i realized that permaculture consulting is sort of like visiting an oracle there's a discussion a design discussion about you know what you might want to do in the future so the principles would come out and they would help to support these sort of short mini permaculture design consultations on people's business or educational path or garden, you know, or just permaculture life in general. So it's been really interesting to see the idea of creating games with no rules and no set guidelines and trying to think at that pattern level where people can take the tools and really use them in whatever way they want. And so they can be really diverse and able to be applied in unique and creative ways. As I always regret, these times that we have together come to a close quicker than I would like. In the time we have remaining together, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners? I'm really excited about the future of permaculture. I know that everything that's happening in our world is helping to support our own evolution. And permaculture is perfectly poised to support people's evolution, their individual evolution, you know, with their diet and their lifestyle and their home and people's community life and their livelihood, their business, the way they're relating to their neighbors and their community. So it's exciting to see all these new permaculture tools. There's a new permaculture card deck that just came out of Australia, Brenna Quinlan, that I have here, which I really love. And it's interesting to see all these new tools and new books and videos and the unlocking of permaculture design online and all these different ways that we can support people on their own journey, where they live in the context of their own lives. I'm so excited and so inspired. And one of the touchstones for me on my learning journey has been the permaculture podcast. And I've just listened to it countless times while gardening, while out on hikes, You know, it's been a real anchor for me and something that's pushed me forward by stimulating my creative mind, giving me new ideas to consider. So I really have recommended it to anyone I've come in contact with in my classes and people I've met around. So I see you really as a visionary and what you've done, you've really forged new ground. And now so many people around the world are really following in the footsteps of a lot of what you've done. And so it's awesome that permaculture is achieving this level of accessibility through technology that maybe was never imagined in the earlier iterations of permaculture. And I really feel the next step is for the global permaculture network to get more interconnected and to come together on a planetary scale in relation to sharing of information, 
of best practices, you know, top tips and do's and don'ts and creating all of this media that can appeal to and support people from different cultures, from different walks of life, different educational backgrounds. So I love the diversity that's emerging and I'm really excited to see how technology and media can support people in their really down to earth journey of just living where they are. Well, thank you for joining me today and adding your voice to the Permaculture Podcast and being my guest. I really appreciate the time that we've been able to spend together after, you know, years of trading emails and ideas that we had an opportunity to share our voices with one another in this conversation. Thanks so much. It's been really inspiring to talk to you. Thank you so much. And that was Delvin Solkinson. Find out more about his work, including his Permaculture Design Notes book, and the Permaculture Design Deck at VisionaryPermaculture.com. I'm a long-standing advocate of open-source ideas and technology, using them wherever possible. I produced the podcast on a Linux laptop for years, and continue to do most of the audio editing in Audacity, so enjoy Delvin's approach to making as much of what he can readily available, while also acting as a curator to assemble the best of what he's discovered. You can find all of those essentials, distilled down from his years of work, for free in various forms on his website. You can download the PDFs to read on your digital device, print copies of the cards and games to play with and use as your own design oracles, and, if you'd like, you can also purchase physical copies from Delvin to further support the ongoing production of these ever-valuable tools. Do you use any open-source tools or know someone else who curates knowledge to this level? Let me know. Leave a comment in the show notes, email show at the permaculturepodcast.com, or drop something in the post. The Permaculture Podcast, P.O. Box 16, Dauphin, Pennsylvania, 17018. Until the next time, spend each day deepening your understanding of permaculture while taking care of Earth, yourself, and each other.